Hi, I'm the Space Quest historian. Look, I'll be up front with you. I have now finished the entire game, so I know how all this ends. But there's a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna keep the episodic format for now, just with a lot less speculation about where the plot might be heading. With that said, welcome to this very special episode of SQH Overthinks the Shit Out of Puzzles. Instead of going around doing good deeds to boost our social standing, all we have to do is steal this guy's poem from his tablet, and then his butler robot will give us an extra ticket for the gala. Now that I've said that out loud, does any of that sound like something that would happen in a Beneath the Steel Sky game? Or any cyberpunk game for that matter? Well, strap yourselves in, because it's happening. It's actually an interesting setup. This absolutely hateful twat named... Um, Poet laureate Reginald Arthur Schnipple Esquire? Sure, whatever you say, man. Is sitting in the VIP lounge of a coffee shop, those exist apparently, and we have to steal his poem. The game does not make it clear what we're supposed to do with the poem, which is where the overthinking part comes in. So I can get into the VIP lounge, fine. That's just a matter of hacking the door scanner. I can also lure the guy out of the VIP lounge by changing the music in the cafe to what this diagnostician here outside is listening to, which is supposed to be this ungodly racket, but actually sounds pretty damn awesome. It's easily the best music in the game so far, which, side note, I think has been kind of bland all this time. I mean, the music in the original game was quirky and memorable, but this score is just sort of droning and not very memorable. Apart from this tune, which is great. Welcome, citizen. Anyway, what does this do for us? Nothing. We can, however, set off an alarm in the cafe, which summons this speaker droid. And with Reginald out of the VIP lounge, we can transfer his poem to the speaker droid. Uh, first of all, this took me forever to figure out. Because if you activate the alarm and then try to leave the cafe, this asshole robot comes flying in and asks you who did it. And you can pin the blame on Reginald, which does absolutely nothing. This is a red herring. Another red herring is that you can transfer the poem all the way to the cafe's speaker system, which also does absolutely nothing. See, my logic here was that if we broadcast the poem he's been working on, he'll like throw a fit and go somewhere else or leave his tablet unattended or something. Uh, and you'll notice there's actually two poems on his tablet that we can transfer. One of them is this secret poem that contains very dissenting, unhappy stuff that will probably get the guy jailed. So I thought maybe we'd broadcast that, we'd embarrass him, we'd send him on the run. You can even pipe it into this girl's earbuds and I thought that might send her running off to fetch the authorities, but no, all of this does absolutely nothing, except break the game so this hand scanner doesn't work anymore. Fantastic. What you're supposed to do is transfer the poem to the speaker droid, then follow the speaker droid down to this brooch kiosk, and transfer the poem from the speaker droid to the kiosk so you can then copy the poem onto your brooch. Are you still with me? I forgot to mention we're wearing this stupid brooch because that's what led us into the fan service exhibit at the museum. It didn't seem important at the time. My question is, if the speaker droid can float around and recite this hateful shit out loud, why couldn't the loudspeaker in the cafe? Why didn't the diagnostician react to it? Why doesn't the droid at the brooch kiosk react when all the holograms change? In fact, why didn't anybody react at all when the speaker droid was just buzzing around reciting word vomit about fake smiles and bile to everyone? This whole fiasco, I think, serves to highlight the unfortunate disservice that this whole hacking minigame thing does to the game. See, the hacking thing gives you a world of freedom, but it's the wrong kind of freedom. It gives you too many options, but in the game's mind there's only one solution. And the game is not very good with giving you hints as to how it wants you to accomplish something. So you're constantly throwing ideas around that the game will gladly let you do, but give you absolutely no feedback on. And what it all boils down to is just swapping nodes around until it triggers a cutscene, which means you've done what the game expected you to do. See, the hacking thing would have been a perfect vehicle for a host of multiple solution type puzzles, 
But instead, you've got a mechanic that lets you do a wide variety of crazy shit with absolutely no results and no feedback. It just sits back and watches you piss around in circles, waiting for you to eventually do the thing that the designers wanted you to do. There's a term for that. Wasted effort. It's like this Star Trek The Next Generation game, A Final Unity, where they literally programmed in half the galaxy. And you are free to take the Enterprise to any of these sodding, lifeless balls of rock at any time you want, but nothing happens there. Either you follow the plot of the game, or you're just farting around the galaxy wasting dilithium. So why did they put the entire fucking galaxy in here? Well, because it looks impressive when you say, we put the entire galaxy in the game. You can literally go anywhere. And it's the same with Beyond the Steel Sky. It's impressive to say, you can hack every mechanical device in the game, which you can't, but let's just pretend you can. It sounds great until you realize you can't actually make them do anything interesting. It's not even a fun distraction because no one reacts to the shit you do unless they've been specifically scripted to do so. This is just a gameplay gimmick. Now, it could have been a fun gameplay gimmick, and I have a suspicion it was meant to be able to do a lot more than what we got here in terms of affecting the world around us. But as it is now, I'm sorry, but all it does is just piss me off. Where were we? Oh yeah, Ticket to the Gala. Uh, I figured we'd give the butler robot the hateful poem, because I cannot go through a game without ruining somebody's life, so it might as well be this hovering fuckstick. Right, fast forward to the gala itself, and Foster immediately spies some suspicious people running down the rafters that nobody else sees. Did Foster get bit by a radioactive spider between the games? I had to find a way to get up to that walkway and find out where they were going. Anyway, we run into Raquel, fresh off the brain-scrambling sure retreat, and to no one's surprise, she's all better now and doesn't remember a thing. If you, like me, are wondering what triggered her rebellious behavior, or the sudden sleeper agent-like awakening at the uttering of her name, then good luck with that, because this is the last we'll ever see of her, and none of that pays off in any meaningful way whatsoever. Anyway, we cause a distraction that lets us ride up in the service elevator to follow the shadowy figures. The distraction itself is pretty funny, but I still have no idea how I actually solved this. All I know is it involved some more hacking bullshit. Look, would you get the fuck out of my way, please? Thank you. Jeez, look, I understand having these NPCs walking around sort of livens up the place, but the pathfinding is just a bit off at times. Just, just a smidge. No, no, really, just... Just a smidge. Right, we're on the roof now. It was very nice of the shadow people to wait around long enough for me to actually figure out the puzzle down on the floor. And now they're gonna have to wait a bit longer because I just have to see a droid and his master get sent off to the fucking gulags for writing dissentious poetry. After all the effort I'd put in to get that poem, I had to see it performed live. The city smiles upon us with breath of mint and bile. And you can expect a visit from me later. Shall I fetch Sir's coat? Well, that was a bit underwhelming. I was expecting a flogging at least. Oh well, back to the chase. Ah, uh, here we go. Camera's a bit tight on Foster, so we all know what's coming. Three, two, one. Yep, there it is. And it's... Oh, it's Orana. Hey, that's a nice twist. Hey, I wonder if she has sort of an intriguing backstory about how and why she became an undercover operative against the oppressive regime. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That doesn't pay off in any meaningful way either. She's just a plot device. And who is her lovely companion? Why, it's... Danielle Piermont? Hold the fucking phone here for a minute. Why? Why in the name of fuck is Daniel Piermont here? Look, I, I was okay with her Hello. being like the primary benefactor of this museum thing. That That's in line with the Daniel Piermont I know. But Daniel Piermont is a self-centered, oblivious, a narcissistic, possibly prescription drug-addled housewife alive. with no regard or interest in the well-being of others. In the first game, she's this snooty monster who gleefully admits to leaving her husband's funeral because her dog felt ill. If anyone should be okay with the oppressive, class-based system where social status is the rule of the land, then it would be Daniel Piermont. What the fuck is she doing here? So you were both friends. I'm sorry, I just cannot get over this. This is just wrong on so many levels. Why Piermont? Of all the characters you had at your disposal, why Piermont? Why not Hobbins? 
Why not the secret agent from Hobart who poses as a gardener? In fact, why not the kid who played violent video games on the bench next to him? That would have been interesting. The kid grows up under an oppressive regime, which is then overthrown, only to be replaced by another oppressive regime, and the kid ditches the mindless distractions to take action and change society. I mean, why the fuck did it have to be? Oh, I'm sorry, Foster just got knocked out and taken to the brain scrambling factory. The game tips its hand early here to reveal that the main antagonist is, in fact, Robert Joey, the version of Joey we left in charge of Union City at the end of the last game. Don't worry, I'll complain more about that in the later episode. For now, it's time for Joey here, Robot Joey, to take charge. Yes, we get to play as Joey for about three minutes, and then we knock this dude off a ledge, and it's right back to Foster. Foster has now decided that the council is pure evil, even though he has no proof yet that the council is behind any of this, but they must be stopped at all costs now because reasons. Also, they kidnapped Ember here. She will perform no action of any value whatsoever. She's just here because the game is worried you might have forgotten about her. Anyway, Foster devises a plan to get all the kidnapped children out the way we came in. Let's just hope Leet hasn't skipped town before we had a chance to find out how he was planning to get Poppy out. Oh, well, shit. Right, well, as you can tell, the game is heading down a path I am not really very keen on, and I'm afraid it's not going to get much better from here on. I'll try and get the other episodes of this progress report out fairly quickly, since all I need to do is just write up my thoughts and edit them. I already have all the footage. So, um, in conclusion, thank you very much for watching this, and I'll see you around the Chrono Stream. Bye!